This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So it's Society. my pleasure um, to welcome you all to the American Numismatic Society this evening for the presentation of the Archer M. Huntington Medal Award to Dr. Ruth Pliego. The Huntington Award is conferred annually in honor of the late Archer uh, M. Huntington, president of the ANS, from 1905 until 1910. The award was first presented to Edward T. Newell in 1918 and honors those with outstanding career contribution to numismatic scholarship. The original medal was designed by Emil Fuchs in 1908 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the society founding. In 2023, the society commissioned a new medal for the award, which was designed by Eugene L. Daub. The obverse of the new medal features an open book that symbolizes scholarship, and the reverse shows the outline uh, of coins. Following the presentation of the medal, Dr. Priego will present the Sylvia uh, Mani Herter um, Memorial Lecture, Archer and Huntington and Visigothic Coins, revisiting the La Capilla Horde. In 1996, Sylvia Herter and owed the Thompson Memorial Fund in, hon in honor of former ANS chief curator and post Huntington Honorary, past, sorry, Huntington Honorary Margaret Thompson for a lecture at the award presentation. The lecture was renamed in Miss Hunter Honor upon her passing in 2009. Now, I would like to welcome NS Chief Curator Peter Van Alphen for the introduction of Dr. Piego and her accomplishments. Peter. Thank you, Jill. <clears throat> and I would also like to um, express my greetings and welcome, especially to our visitors from Spain. So a very welcome to you as well. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you a very dear friend and colleague, the recipient of the American Numismatic Society's 2023 Huntington Award, Dr. Ruth Pliego. Dr. Pliego's distinguished career <clears throat> began at the University of Sevilla, where she received her doctorate, and where today she serves as lecturer and researcher in the Department of Prehistory and Archaeology. In addition to this position over the years, she has held a number of renowned fellowships and residencies, including those at the Casa de Velázquez in Madrid, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Paris, at the École Pratique des Hautes Etudes, also in Paris, and here in the United States, she has held a Firestone Library Fellowship at Princeton University, and this year, as I'm sure all of you know, she is the Eric P. Newman Fellow here at the American Numismatic Society. Her other research residencies include those at the University of Padea in Italy, at the University of Hamburg's Roman Islam Center, and at the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Now, <clears throat> such invitations and fellowships do not, of course, come easy. They necessarily reflect a high level and quality of scholarship that is widely recognized. And in this, Dr. Pliego has excelled, which is, of course, the reason the Huntington Committee selected her as the recipient of this most prestigious award. Dr. Pliego's numismatic focus has been primarily on the Visigothic Kingdom, and in this field, she is the recognized authority having made extensive and critical contributions to our understanding of the kingdom, its history, and of course, its coinage. 
And among her numerous publications is her two-volume magnum opus, La Moneda Visigoda, published in 2009 and since in 2012, updated with La Moneda Visigoda, Anexo Un. And this has become, of course, the standard reference for Visigothic kingdom or kingdom coinage. More recently, she has also published the handy English summary, Visigothic Currency, Recent develops, Developments, and Data for its Study. She is never one to rest, however, and she is currently working on a comprehensive approach to examining Visigothic bronze coinage from a broader Mediterranean perspective, which includes the study of various hordes, including La Capilla Horde, which she will present to us this evening. In addition to these numerous publications and this ongoing work, Dr. Pliego is an active and enthusiastic participant in various international collaborations in the digital humanities as it is applied to numismatics, including her important contributions to the Moneda Iberica project, an online digital catalog of Iberian coinages, <coughs> excuse me, and to the flame or framing the late antique and early medieval economy project, which is how based at Princeton University. And she is also currently a co-coordinator on, on the La Monnaie de Dan la um, Occident Méditerranéen or Monom project, which is based at Casa de, uh, de Velázquez, which is in Madrid. So it is, of course, Dr. Pliego's numerous and outstanding scholarly contributions that we are honoring this evening. And as a Huntington Award recipient, her name will now be inscribed alongside those other numismatic luminaries, such as Ernst Babylon, Edward Newell, and Cecile Morrison who have received this award since its inception in 1918. And I will note as well that Dr. Pliego is the first Spanish woman to receive this award and only the third Spaniard following Felipe Matu López in 1979 and Leandre Villaronga in 1993. The fact that Dr. Pliego is a recipient of this award, a recipient of an award bearing his name, would, I'm sure, please Archer Huntington immensely. He did, after all, have a tremendous passion for Iberian cultures, languages, and arts, and of course, coins. So Ruth, my heartiest congratulations on this wonderful award, and I will now turn it back to Gilles to confer the award to you. <laughs> okay, over to you. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the American Numismatic Society and its current president, Dr. Ute Battenberg, and its executive director, Dr. Gilles Bransworth, for awarding me to the 1023 Huntington Medal. Thank you, Peter, for your words. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be the recipient of this unique award. Gratitude and honor are the feelings that encompass many others that came to my mind when I received the news and that follow the initial surprise, including a tremendous emotion, joy, and of course, satisfaction. I feel also very fortunate is not always hard work that is rewarded in this way. Dr. Sophia Cremidi, another recent recipient of the Huntington Medal, emphasized that progress is being made, uh, referring to the role women have recently played in our academic community. 
Being the 11th woman to receive this medal makes me feel doubly rewarded. I would also like to remember the other researchers who have received this award, especially the Spanish ones, Felipe Mateo Llopis and Leandre Villaronga, who each in their own field contributed to the development of numismatic research in my country, my country, Spain. There are other people that I would like to mention, but I will leave them for the last minutes of my presentation. There is no doubt that an award of this kind is also a breath of fresh air that renews the commitment to research and the responsibility for its continuity in future generations. I would also li like to take this, opportun this opportunity to send the Eric Payne Newman grant, which will allow me to spend part of this summer in New York, doing what I love most, working with coins and with students. I am also very fortunate to be able to devote my research to a subject closely related to the namesake of this medal. Archer Milton Huntington. The topic I am proposing, as you can see in the slide, will address, among other questions, the Huntington's relationship to Visigothic coins, and in particular with La Capilla, one of the largest known Visigothic hoards and the largest of those preserved in a remarkable proportion in the institution that hosts us, the American Numismatic Society. The Visigothic hold of La Capilla owes, to, uh, owes its name to the property in the town of Carmona, in the province of Seville, where it was discovered. For those of you who are not familiar with the Spanish geography, I will put you in context with these maps. In the picture, you can see uh, the town of Palmona in the province of Seville, which is in the region of Andalusia. Carmona is one of the oldest cities in the West. Its strategic location made it one of the first centers of indigenous power in Western Andalusia since pre-Roman times, and it played a leading role in the wars between the Carthagin Carthaginians and the Romans in this area of the lower Guadalquivir. The importance of Carmona in ancient times is summed up in this sentence by Julius Caesar, who said that it was by far the strongest city in the entire province. The importance of Carmona in the sources is also proven, as we will see in a moment, by its enormous archeological power. Carmona is also one of those cities in the southern Spain whose beauty attracted artists and intellectuals from all, all over Europe, especially in the 19th century. One of these artists was George Bonsor, who after obtaining his degree in fine arts, wanted to travel around Spain and especially Andalusia finally deciding to settle in Carmona. The name of George Bonsor, better known as Jorge Bonsor, has entered to the history of Spain, not for his artistic talent, which he certainly had, but for being one of the pioneers of archeology span in our country. Once settled in Carmona, Bonsor established contact with a group of local intellectuals who were actively interested in the antiquities of this city and the sur surrounding areas. One of these was Juan Fernandez Lopez, with whom he collaborated in the purchase, purchase of the land where they discovered and excavated a part of the Roman Carmona. 
This is considered the first modern systematic excavation in Spain. In this picture, we see him in one of the tombs of the necropolis, the tomb of Servilia. Very famous is also this tomb, the tomb of the elephant, which takes its name from the sculpture of an elephant. Carmo also had one of the most important and productive means in the province of Baetica, minting bronze aces and divisors until the first century BC. And several de decades after the hold of La Capilla was hidden, Carmona minted at, le at least one issue during the reign of Erguir, of which only two examples are known. The commitment to archaeology and the history of the city led this group of intellectuals to create the Archaeological Society of Carmona in 1885, just six years before the discovery of La Capilla Hold. With this introduction, I am trying to show the cultural atmosphere that was alive in Carmona when the discovery of the hold took place. Thanks to a member of the Carmona Archaeological Society, we know the details of the discovery of the hold. Manuel Fernandez Lopez, brother, uh, brother of Bonsor's archaeological collaborator, Juan Fernandez Lopez, published this small book four uh, years after the discovery. He says that on the 27th day of August, year 1891, a mason nicknamed Harana was digging in the hearth at a pistol shot from the country house called La Capilla to open the foundation of a, of a wall when at the depth of the 25 centimeters the hole stumbled on a clay pot that jumped to piece, pieces and showed this, the ground with gold coins. The author says that another worker discovered Harana keeping the coins, and when he realized it, there was a death street. Either you live or I'll kill you. To which the other replied, kill me, but I want my share. To the shouts uh, and exclamation of both came the other companions, and it's easy to understand the scene that followed. The authors also say that fortunately, the hoard was large and there were coins for everyone. In his narrative, Manuel Fernandez Lopez tells us that during the siesta, under the shade, is always in Seville, mm -hmm. under the shade of the trees, they began to wonder what uh, those pieces uh, so thin and full of marks that no one understood where, which is not surprising given in the image of one of these coins. Like any experienced uh, numismatists, they began to wonder about the metal they were made of, although the techniques for determi uh, determining it were not overly careful. The author says that they split some with the their death, a scratcher other with nails, and barred not a few. But uh, that even the, uh, with this, they could not satisfy their curiosity. With a certain irony, the author says also that when they were most enthusiastic in their metallurgical experiments, one of them who enjoyed the reputation of being the most enlightened of the gun, saying in a context to a stone, the are brass tokens. The news came, uh, came as a cold shower. The conviction of the low value of the hoard 
had another disastrous consequence. Manuel Fernández López recounts that once the initial displeasure had passed and they were in the Corbones, the river, uh, the Nervi River, they began to joke and throw the coins at each other. The, the author estimates that 50 of them must have been lost in the river among the laughter and jokes. The next day, they gave away some of these brass tokens as a souvenir, and the lucky ones soon realized the value of the gift. They went with the news to the owner of the farmhouse, General Chinchilla, who, say, uh, who sent for all the coins and managed to present 755 of them, of which he kept 250. Imagine the workers' surprise when they discovered that they, uh, they hoard was actually precious gold coins. They decided to make a single lot and left the negotiation to the master of the crew. Okay. From this point on, Manuel Fernandez Lopez tells us that there was a constant flow of merchants, including foreigners, and, where, and while the business was being closed after much insistence, he had the opportunity to see the coins. Although he points out that he only had an hour to examine them. From the beginning, he understood that it was a hold of Visigothic gold coins. Although as we will see Manuel Fernandez Lopez's uh, book, Lopez's book was published four years after the discovery, is one of the first approximation to the composition of the hold, reaching the conclusion that it would have contained about 1,000 pieces. Mm. The author, the author also tells us that the workers Lot was sold in Seville for seven pesetas, pesetas each. The peseta was the national currency of Spain prior to, to Euro. The real current uh, value would be about $35, but in labor value would rise to $250 or $500 or euros. But in purchasing power, it could be a little over 1,000. This explains the movement of traders, even outsiders, who, as the author tells us, paraded through Carmona in those days. We know that Juan Fernandez y Lopez obtained a small of coins, lot of, of coins, all of them quite rare and illustrated in his brother's book. We will see a little later what has become of them. There is no doubt about the importance of the Royal uh, Academy of the History in the protection of heritage. A moment. Uh, since its foundation in 1735. Therefore, when this institution learned of the discovery, it made every effort to restore, at least in documentary form, the integrity of the hold. In the image, we see the record of the telegram that the secretary sent to the president of the Archaeological Society of Carmona, Sebastián Gómez Muñiz. The main interest was to know the destination of the coins. Seville was mentioned, but also Paris without excluding other points. Por tanto, esta institución al tener... It's a movie. Sorry. Ay. 
thing has uh, uh, the control <laughs> and stop. <laughs> I can't do pass. Okay, sorry. The Royal Academy of History entrusted one of its members, Celestino Puyori Camps, with the difficult task of reconstructing the route taken by the coins after their sale in Seville. Unfortunately, this researcher died only two months after the commission, but his work was fundamental to the reconstruction of the whole. The Royal Academy of History proposed Aureliano Fernandez Guerra to continue the war. However, he also died shortly after, two years later. This explains the concert of Manuel Fernandez Lopez, who says in the prologue of his book that this was the fact that no numismatic authority had dealt with the hold with the due extension that led him to publish the new leave it in the present time. We must now consider this essential figure in the promotion of Hispanic studies and so closely linked to the American Numismatic Society. Archer Milton Huntington, the adopted son of a railroad magnate and collector, devoted his life to the, study, uh, to the study of his Spanish culture. He amassed an impressive private collection of paintings, sculpture, books, and manuscripts, and countless other archaeological objects, including a magnificent numismatic collection of nearly 38,000 coins. Huntington's first trip to Spain took place in 1892. Uh, one uh, year after the discovery of La Capilla. Although it was not until 1898 of his, uh, of his third trip to Europe that he went to the south of Spain. It must have been then that he came into, into contact with George Ponsor. Seeing is uh, in that year that the epistolary relationship between them seems to have begun. It was also at this time that Huntington, having discovered that uh, the French archaeologist uh, Arthur Angel had abandoned his excavation at the site of Italica in Seville, managed to rent the site and started his own excavation. In fact, the artifacts discovered in Italica, together with those acquired from George Bonsor's excavation in Carmona, form, form the core of the archaeological collection that could become part of the Hispanic Society of America. Let us remember that Paris was one of the destination of the Capilla's coins. It was in Paris that this important collector, Rafael Cervera, sold his collection years later in 1902. Here we see him in a portrait by the Spanish painter Joaquin Sorolla, who, as you know, also had such a close relationship with Archer Huntington. We know that Huntington bought the Cervera collection as well as the Codera collection of uh, Islamic coins because he uh, himself taught Bonsor in a letter dated March 8, 1902. The ANS keeps an interesting document that contains the coins that made up the Cervera collection. It contains 179 Visigothic coins, and not only are the legends of the coins faithfully described of birds on even pages and reverse on old, but also the weight, which is the, in the absence of illustration of the coins, helps to identify them, and the origin. 
either the sellers, individuals, or professionals who gave their names to well-known auction houses. Sometimes uh, it also includes the provenance, especially in the case of the Carmona find and the catalog here, Hallazgo, Hallazgo Carmona, and the catalog number of the reference uh, book of that, that, uh, that time, that is Hayes, Alos Hayes, the, the reference book of Visigoth coin in this moment. Several decades later, this author, George Miles, a leading specialist in Islamic numismatics, came on the scene. He joined the INS in 1646, where he not only served as curator of Islamic coins, but also studied the extensive collection of coins that Archer Huntington had donated to the Hispanic Society of America, and which were later transferred to the American Numismatic Society. In 1947, he wrote this letter to the previously mentioned Spanish researcher, Felipe Mateo Llopis, informing him, among other things, that he was beginning to study Visigothic numismatics and that he hoped to become more and more familiar with it. Five years later, George Miles published a work on the coinage of the Visigoths that is still relevant to the present day. Miles soon discovered that the bulk of the collection came from two sources, the Visigothic Hall of La Capilla and the collection of Ra Rafael Cervera y Royo, recently mentioned. The relationship with the Spanish researchers was quite, uh, quite uh, fluid, not only with the uh, af aforementioned Mateo Llopis, but also with Pio Beltran Villagrasa, who provided him with the list of Puyol y Camps, or La Capilla, uh, that I, we are seeing uh, prior, and on which his own reconstruction of the whole is based. Those unfamiliar with Visigothic coinage may wonder what is so special about it. To summarize, and in honor of the institution that hosts us, I will use, although not literally, the first words of George Miles in his magnificent and fundamental work. The history of coinage in Western Europe is marked by the introduction of a strictly autonomous and national currency in Visigothic Spain under King Leovigil. And the author follows saying that this coinage is the first really distinctive medieval coinage of the West, and it continues virtually without interruption until the Umayyad conquest of the Iberian Peninsula in the 711. It should be added that during the development of this coinage, there were advanced an innovation that had a, a significant influence on nearby kingdoms and its symbolic, uh, symbolic elements transcended the borders of their territory. The Royal Visigothic coinage develops between the reign of Leovigil alone in 572 until the end of the reign of Aquila II, around 713 or 14. In my opinion, the most distinctive feature of the Visigoth coinage is its eminently royal character. The coin that you see in the image is the result of the last monetary reform undertaken by Leovigil towards the, the end of his reign, when its elements were standard, standardized and fixed. These are the name of the king. You can see Leovigildus, the title rests on the obverse, 
And in the reverse, <laughs> sorry, Toleto and the epithets, uh, royal epithets, used to in this case. And also in this case, the mean Toleto. Therefore, there are no gold issues made by people or groups outside, outside the monarchy. And all uh, and on all these gold coins appear the name of the monarch and the title of Rex. At the bottom of the of the slide, I have collected. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, the reigns of rebels and usurpers. One of these. Uh, okay, don't worry. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, I have collected all the reigns, including the joint reigns, the reign of rebels and usurpers. As we see in a moment, this usurper, usurper, Udila, is only known uh, thanks to the Capilla Hold, Udila. Therefore, we have on the obverse, the allusion to the king, and on the reverse, the reference to the territory, that is, the mint. The mention of the mint is another fundamental aspect of this coinage. About 100 Visigothic cities minted throughout their territory, with the peculiarity that more than half of them were in the province of Galicia. The multiplicity of means in Galicia is one of the great topics of this coinage, and I can tell you that uh, several of these means are known exclusively from the hold of La Capilla. Focusing on the subject, Miles was the first published reconstruction of La Capilla hold. He used both the Cervera inventory and the list of Puyol Icams, agreeing with the let later uh, on the final number of 767 pieces. With regard to the Cervera, Miles complained that the coins had been missed up and the provenance had not been taken into account, so that without image uh, to refer to, he could not always accurately identify those from the whole. However, Miles was aware that many more coins than he knew uh, from the above list from the above list came from La Capilla. He discovered that uh, what he called the Capilla Soleil evidence a peculiar patina that many of the coins in the Huntington repertory, repertoire have and that is still visible of many of them today, as can be seen in this uh, image. In fact, a look at the composition of Miles Corpus clearly show the distortion that occurs in the rain present in the Capilla Hold, especially in those of Swintilla and Cicenan, something that, my, uh, that Miles already saw. Before the Capilla, the coins of Cicenan were very scarce, and in his corpus account for three quarters of the known coins. The Capilla is therefore clearly a hold hidden in the time of Cicenan and contains coin clo uh, coins close in time from Recaret the first, although uh, is the monarch uh, Suintila is the monarch uh, most represented. As I have already mentioned, 
the hoard includes coins of the usurper Udila. This coin came to the Hispanic Society of America through the Cervera collection, which acquired that of the Spanish collector called Vidaurre. In a letter to von Sor Huntington is rejoiced that no other coins of this rare king have been found. But unfortunately, although only uh, the Huntington's is from the mint of Emerita, there are three known coins in the name of Judila. One preserved in the numismatic cabinet of Catalonia and another that up, appeared in a commercial auction a few years ago. Both were struck at the mint of Eliberry, current Granada. In this sense, the hoard of La Capilla was so important that in later times, coins from it have continued to appear. As far as the composition of the king is concerned, it must uh, be emphasized that is surprising the absence of another ephemeral king, Precaret II, son of Sisebutus, and that we also knew th thanks to another great horde also discovered in the province of Seville in the 80s, very close to the one uh, of La Capilla, the hold of Fuentes de Andalucía. But unlike, unlike uh, the Capilla, that of Fuentes was quickly dispersed. As a curiosity, among the few known means in the name of these kings are also Emerita and Eliberi. On the other hand, on the, other, uh, hand the most represented province is Baetica, with a difference with respect to the rest. It's a striking the absence of coins from Narbonne, Narbona and the scarce representation of the means of Tarraconensis compared to those of Galaesia, which is a peculiar province of rare pieces. As for Lusitania, most of the specimens comes from the mint of Emerita which, curiously, is the most represented in the hold. Note that in re, uh, actually um, the presence of other Lusitanian means is quite uh, scarce, surpassed by those of the Galician capital, Bracara. These that you see are the most common types uh, of the hold. The kings, Suintila and Cicena, and the mint of Emerita. Emerita is, is Merida. Both then, both of these uh, coins uh, are in ANS. And curiosi curiously, it's uh, followed in number of coins by a mint that is probably overrepresented. Mm -hmm overrepresented in the corpus due to this horse, namely the already mentioned Eliberi. There, there are also numerous coins from Ispali, and as we have already seen, in the years following uh, the fine coins from the horse have continued to be added to the corpus. On the right of the slide, you can see a specimen that I found by chance in the scarce Visigothic collection of the Archaeological Museum of Seville, and on which the label could be read Carmona, although without any reference to the hold. As you can see, not only the external data a match, but also the color of patina. This was not only a novelty that uh, I include. Um, when I made my own reconstruct, uh, reconstruction of the hold, re, uh, review, review, reviewing the, the documentation of the Royal Academy of the History, 
I found an anonymous and clearly misplaced document. The date of uh, 1892 and the identification of the engraved coin support this identification. Among the, them, we have already alluded to the importance of the Galician means, and among Sisebut repertoire, the coins of today uh, in Galicia, actual, uh, current uh, tweet, does not appear in the list of Fernandez Lopez, but in that of Jorge Bonsol, and is now conserved in the ANS. This fact points out that other ways brought peace, pieces to the Hispanic Society of America. The coin is better than the photo. <laughs> <laughs> other authors have published coins for La Capilla. Sorry also for the quality of the Im image. While other coins of the hall have appeared on the numismatic market. In 1969 and 1982, Javier Calico published an important group of coins, all of them exceptional from the hall. Sorry also for the quality. And much more recently, the ones you see in the picture. In fact, in 2009, just before the final manuscript of my book was handed over to the University of Seville for printing, printing uh, an auction catalog was published by a Spanish commercial firm in which the important collection of the Caballero de las Indias was offered for sale. The Visigoth part Consider, uh, consisted of 1,669 coins, many of which were already mentioned in my corpus, seeing the diverse provenance of the repertoire include pieces from Reinhardt, Colle Reinhardt Collection, the Marques de Llano, Carles Torra, and others. Already at that time, I seem to see the, tra the trace of the capillas hold, the patina, in the composition of part of the set in which there are abundant spe specimens of Cicebutus, Swintilla, and Cicenan. In addition to the magnificent uh, coin of Judila of Eliberi that uh, we have already seen. Also, this. Uh, coin of Cicenan, uh, the mint of uh, Emerita, was auctioned not long ago by a French firm. If you see, also in the label, uh, put uh, the uh, Trouvel de la Capilla. There is also a group of coins, the only ones in the province of Seville, whose relationship to the whole is certain, that were donated by the brother of the author of this book to a religious brotherhood in Carmona to form part of the tresor of the local Virgin Santa Maria de Gracia. In the picture, there are 11 coins, but, in, but actually the set consists in 25 coins plus a piece of Ejica, which obviously did not belong to the hold. I only have one photo showing all the coins mount, mounted in a frame. Some of them are unique specimens, and, this, uh, and in this sense, the only one of the Swintilla from the Galicia uh, mean of Cenabria is the one uh, you see in this picture. And this is the only Cicena of Bracara uh, in the corpus. In addition to these unique coins, there are variants of unique ones from other kings and means. Although so far I have not been able to access to the study to study them, it seems that there is a possibility to do so very soon, I hope. So this is the graph of the composition by King in the current Visigothic corpus, with the addition made in 2018. The distorting trend continues, as you can see, 
obviously uh, the ephemeral record this uh, the second appears here here and the same is observed if we look at means as we see emerita is the most numerous mean in the corpus followed by ispali and tolit Therefore, as Miles uh, point out, any interpretation of mint activity product, activity or production volume must take this reality into account, among other things. In spite of what has been said, we can continue to explore this hold. First and foremost, we have the opportunity to begin uh, the direct analysis of what Miles called the Capilla Soleil. And for this, I hope to work closely with David Jung, thank you, uh, curate, the curator of uh, this institution. There is also uh, an enormous amount of work to be done of the study of the dice, a thing that is often repeated by our friend Peter Bartlett, whom I would also like to mention here. On the other hand, working directly with the material facilitates another complex task, such as the comparison of the list, both those of Puyoli camps and those of Cervera. It would also be worthwhile to study the documentation that exists for the other great horde from the south of the province of Seville, that of Fuentes. I believe that the joint study of both hordes will open up important lines of interpretation. Let us not forget that, that even fragmented hordes have the capacity to provide valuable, uh, valuable information, as my esteemed Francisca Chavez Tristan was able to demonstrate in her studies of the hordes of southern Spain. Part of this war is already underway, as I have seen working for some time on a very innovative project for the management and research of numismatic material, which some of you already know. We are talking about Moneda Iberica and Org. In this point, I would like to thank Manuel Gozalves and Pere Pau Ripollés for leading the innovation of numismatic in Spain. A and for hosting me in their project. Before I close, I want to thank you all for coming. I also want to thank my colleagues at the American University Society, Peter, Lucia, Davy, all of you, for your warm welcome and your help. I, can, uh, I cannot name everyone, but I would like to thank my dearest friend, my companion in joy and toil, especially to those who wanted to be here with me today. Other friends have been very close these years of war and uncertainty. They know who they are. Thank you very much from my heart. I would also like to remember to people who have always supported me in, in my research and who I'm sure would have been very happy with this award. Who are no longer, uh, no longer here, they are Gonzalo Cores and Francisco Alcaide. I also want to remember my entire family and my closest family, a representation of which is here today. I thank my sister for her immense help, my brothers, my niece, nephews, and of course my parents, <clears throat> to whom I would like to dedicate this award. I owe my relationship with numismatics and my interest in Visigothic coins to my father. Thanks that. And please allow me to say my last words in Spanish. Gracias, mamá, por todo lo demás. Thank you very much for your attention.
Congratulate Dr. Pliego on this wonderful and fascinating talk that she gave and for finding a way to weave Archer Huntington into the narrative as well. This um, really is the first time in memory, in fact, that I've heard of Huntington awardee weave Archer Huntington into the story in, in the talk. So congratulations on that. Um, since she also mentioned Soroya, Joaquin Soroya, the famous painter, also want to draw your attention to a Soroya painting in the next room of Ernst Badenon, one of the previous awardees of the Huntington Award as well, too. So as we were leaving tonight, if you want to take a look and enjoy the painting okay. on the wall there, please do. Um, if you are willing, Ruth, would you be open to some questions then? Okay. All right. If there are any questions from our live audience or from our virtual audience, um, Ruth would be happy to take them at this time. Gilles, Gilles. Uh, we have a microphone that uh, Ryan will bring around. So if you could just wait a moment and use the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Ruth, thank you so much for uh, this uh, uh, fascinating presentation. Um, I have a question. At some point, you drew a map or you showed a map with the means, of the physiologic yes. means. So I couldn't count them. Uh, I guess there were 10 times or 15 times more means in Visigothic Spain than all around the Roman, the later Roman Empire. Um, and if you're looking at the, you know, the successor kingdom, um, Ostrogothic Italy, Frankish Gaul, uh, or the Vandalic North Africa, I mean, none of these um, states uh, set up that many means. How do you explain such a high number of means, means uh, for Visigothic Spain? It's it's you know it's unique okay. in in that period of history. Yes, it's unique. It's uh, the most one of the most uh, feature of this coinage. Yes, uh, this uh, the, this map show all the means uh, that minted in any moment of the period. But this is not constant. The, the big uh, expansion uh, occurs until the middle of the, uh, of the seventh century. Um, and then there are a concentration of the mint in the capitals and the uh, important city in the province. In my opinion, um, in the first time of the uh, Visigothic period, uh, there are not uh, really control of the territory. The kings have to uh, make agreement with the local powers. And this coin, in my uh, opinion, uh, is a way to seal this agreement, this uh, 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 pact with the local power um, to, to mint. But uh, a lot of these coins are unique. For example, all these in Galicia, uh, we have two or three or maybe five coins of mint. So uh, for this reason, I think it's not very used uh, uh, to uh, economy of the period. So uh, in the, uh, with the um, strength of the monarchy in the middle of the center, uh, all this um, concentration in the capital, uh, in my opinion, um, would be uh, to a control of the territory, institutional control. Uh, they have not the, the uh, need to uh, create this agreement with the local power. I don't know if I ask, uh, answer you. Any other questions? Robert. Mr. Hogue. Uh, in the well, Capilla uh, Horde, are there any pre-regal Visigothic coins known? No. They also uh, only recorded Eliuba, Viterig, Gundemar, 
uh, until Yudila, uh, Sisenan and Yudila. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, Ruth, okay. again, my heartiest congratulations on the Huntington Award. My congratulations for this wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank our audience both with us tonight in person as well as online. Thank you for your attendance, and we hope to see you soon again. Thank you.